Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday evening service here at Central Baptist Church. Let's stand together and we'll sing our first hymn, 292, Surely Goodness and Mercy. We'll sing all three verses. Don't forget that last part on the other page there when we get to the last verse. All three verses, 292. A pilgrim was high and low. service. It's good to see you here uh, tonight. Just to uh, share with you a prayer request, just heard uh, Brother Rob uh, Reinhardt uh, had a, a, a mini stroke, I think they're describing it as, and he's, I think, doing well and all, but his wife, Linda, was hoping that we could mention that and, of course, pray for him uh, this evening, which we certainly are glad to do. But uh, let's keep him in prayer, and uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you do for us, and thank you for uh, your goodness and mercy that does follow us all the days of our life. Help us now as we meet together to have our hearts tuned to you. Be with the singing and the preaching. Lord, be with uh, Brother Reinhardt. Help him as he uh, strengthens and recovers now from this. Give the doctors wisdom to figure out exactly what caused it and the, the appropriate treatment. Uh, Lord, be, for, be with Bill Johnson as well, Lord, in the hospital recovering with hip surgery and Lord, we thank you for all that you do for us in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated.
but let's all stand together and we'll sing our next song. Hymn number 224, I Know Whom I Have Believed. We'll sing the first, the second, the fourth, and the last. 224, Know Not Why God's Wondrous Grace. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me He hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for His own. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that He is able. few things this evening, uh, one of them being there's a new uh, Wednesday night ladies prayer group meeting uh, before the service at 6 o'clock over in the school building. Uh, if you have any questions about that, you can see Mrs. Linda McKeever in regards to that. Also coming up this, uh, this coming weekend, a couple of things, uh, a couple of opportunities for fellowship. The first is Saturday morning at 8 o'clock. There will be a uh, fellowship breakfast. Everyone is, is welcome and encouraged to come. There's, of course, no cost uh, to, to come to that, and it may be a good opportunity to invite somebody to come. It is a Veterans Day weekend, so that might uh, encourage you to think about uh, who you could invite to come along with you and your family for that. Also coming up on Sunday night, there's a teen service next week, and also there'll be a chili cook-off sponsored by the youth group. Uh, so there's a sign-up sheet still in the foyer. You can sign up to bring a chili and enter that competition. It's always a good time of fellowship and a lot of different uh, flavors of chili. So it's a, it's a, it's a good uh, way to get together after the service and, and uh, just be encouraged. Um, then also there's a ladies meeting coming up the following week uh, on the 12th, November 12th. So just get a bulletin, keep track of all the things coming up, and, and plan to participate in what you can. Brother Dan. It's time for our bus update for the week. And I want to thank everybody who participated in uh, Super Saturday. It's not uh, visitation just for the bus ministry, but every time we have one, it, it, it affects uh, the bus ministry in a good way, and attendance was good today. So uh, if you uh, participated in that, thank you very much. Uh, I wasn't in junior church this morning because uh, my son was uh, getting baptized this morning, but uh, I asked some college students to uh, do junior church, and three of them did it happily, and uh, they did a good job. Uh, they, because uh, it was, um, uh, we had a young boy named Max, led to the Lord this morning. 
and uh, you know, uh, Max is uh, Naziah and uh, Ziana's uh, little brother. Uh, they're 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 all they're here almost as much as anybody is here. They come to church so much. But praise the Lord for uh, that little guy getting saved this morning. Uh, pray for uh, we're gonna have a pizza day next Sunday. It's always a, a fun time where we can show love to the kids and play with them and. I uh, pray that uh, some new kids will come and uh, we'll just uh, give a chance to give them gospel and uh, show them more about Christ. Man, with all the pizza and the chili and all the other things, breakfast, hope no one came hungry tonight, amen, <laughs> except for the Word of God. Let's stand together. We're going to sing our chorus, Make Me a Blessing. Get around and greet someone tonight. Let them know you're glad to see them here. Make me a blessing. Let's sing our chorus once again as you make your way back to your seat. Make me a blessing. standing if you would and take your hymnals and turn to 394 394 we're going to sing I surrender all and we'll sing all four verses 394 all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust him in his presence there we live I surrender all I surrender all all to be my blessed Savior I surrender all all to Jesus I
danger or anything like that. But <laughs> anyway, now I have to, there was a smell outside and folks are trying to figure it out. So uh, and, uh, Jared's got access to keys and things. So just to make sure there's nothing there. Anyway, you didn't need to know any of that, but here we are. And uh, <laughs> I, I don't mind that you know, but, uh, but Exodus chapter number two, if you would, please turn to Exodus uh, chapter number two. This is uh, one of my favorite, uh, I don't know, favorite, convicting, I don't, impactful, just Bible stories, think about Old Testament Bible stories. And I have a, I have a title tonight for the message. Don't always have a title. I'm not, I'm not that creative, really. <laughs> and, uh, I, uh, but uh, the title of the message is just put it in the basket. <laughs> And we're not talking about the offering, and uh, we're not talking about, not about giving, but, uh, you know, just put it in the basket. There's a, there's, and there's a, a point uh, to that here, but in Exodus chapter number two, we'll pick up, we'll read right in verse number one, we'll read the first ten verses or so of the passage. The Bible says, and there went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. When she could not longer hide him, she took him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein and she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river and her maidens walked along by the river's side and when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? Let me just pause there. That gal got it done right there. I mean, you know what? That's, that's not the deepest theological insight that you'll have today. But, uh, I mean, you imagine stepping up the Pharaoh's daughter and saying, ma'am, I have a suggestion. Would you uh, like, like to consider it here? And, uh, of course, the Lord honored it and blessed it. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will Give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. And the child grew and, brought, and, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, because I drew him out of the water. Now here we are, it's probably a fairly familiar story to most of us here. But just to remind ourselves of the context, this, the nation of Israel is... Uh, uh, has come to strength as a nation in uh, the incubator of Egypt uh, where God had brought them during the time of Joseph and he had uh, came down with about 70 people and they, they're going to leave with a lot more than that. But now is the time where God begins to stirring, it's, it's uh, stirring things to where ultimately many years after this they are going to go out of the land of Egypt and of course there's uh, uh, there were two key edicts that the Pharaoh had given because he felt threatened by the coming power of the nation of Israel. They were uh, things that um, he did not know Joseph before. That's made very clear in chapter number one. And so he had two decrees that he gave, uh, one kind of built upon the other. The first uh, was to the Hebrew midwives in chapter number one that they were to kill any baby boy that was discovered during the birthing process. And uh, I, just from, you know, it's a, essentially a partial birth abortion is uh, apparently the type of thing that, that was uh, being carried out there. And I, I mean, that's a terrible thing. Uh, you know, taking the life of a child... Um, at any point is a terrible, terrible thing and should, have been, should be condemned soundly by 
uh, Christians by those who stand in pulpits that abortion is wrong. It's, it's, a, sin, it's a sin before God, and it is um, something that should be taken uh, very, very seriously. But that didn't work. I mean, there were a couple of other heroes early in this, and uh, they certainly warrant attention at some point, but they're called the Hebrew midwives. They, uh, they, they were the ones that would respond when the Hebrew ladies were having a child, and uh, they came up with a story. They just said, sorry, Pharaoh, by the time we get there, the kid's already born. I mean, you know, and that's, that's outside of this. That was very clearly outside of the scope of, of what they of what they were given to do. And if you ever studied um, any sort of like college level Christian ethics class, they'll go through this scenario. There's a neat, a neat thing to think through about how what they said to Pharaoh and then God blessed them for what, for what they did here. And, and so that, it's an amazing stand of courage that they took in order to uh, preserve the life of those, of those children. And so when that wasn't working, Pharaoh expanded upon that and said in verse number 22 of chapter 1, he, he charged all his people saying, Every son that is born shall, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. He said all, all of the boys, just when they're born, just they go in the river. There obviously was some sort of an age band of when this would apply. Um, I think from all accounts that we have, Aaron was already born Moses' brother, a little bit older than, than Moses was, and he obviously was not one that they were afraid would fall under that particular edict. But, but here comes Moses, and he is born right in the middle of this, where this uh, uh, Pharaoh is commanding them to go throw them in the river to end their lives. And there's a lot of a lot of things that we can draw to that. You know, the, the, the river there, the, the Nile River, was the lifeblood of, of the Egyptian nation. They depended upon it. Uh, so much so that they worshipped it. There, was, there were deities that represented that river. And, and, and you see later on in the plagues that often the, the river is, is um, uh, taken and the river is... Uh, I'll say attacked, and, and, the, and the Lord, Jehovah, shows his superiority over all of the gods, including uh, the, the Nile River, over all of the uh, gods of the Egyptians. And so you think about it from a, a, a pictorial sense of what he is asking them to do. He is asking, he is, he is asking, in order to hamper the progress of God's people, God's chosen people, he's saying, I want you to take your baby boys, and I want you to turn them over to our God. And just think about that. And you know what? Satan's not, Satan really hasn't changed that much since then. You know what he wants us to do? He, he, wants us, he wants to take our children and turn them over to his God and let them be consumed by it all. I mean, it's, it's his, his goal, his desire uh, to do so, and we need to uh, be on guard against that. And so... That was what the, the context into which uh, Moses was born. He should have been uh, put to death, but his parents, who, who are not really named here, but we have their names, they're Amram and Jochebed, uh, they took steps to preserve his life. Now, the focus, and I have no problem with this, certainly, rightfully so, but the, 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 that the focus in chapter 2 is of his mother and his mother's actions, but to remove any doubt of the father uh, being involved here, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23 makes it very clear that the parents, the plural, were uh, both involved in this and both interested in uh, preserving the life, uh, the life here of Moses. Uh, Moses is one of the most powerful figures of the Old Testament. You think about all of the, the Old Testament, Moses is one of the most powerful guys. I, I preached a few weeks ago or a few services ago on Mo, another aspect of his life and we talked a little bit just about his ability, his, his, that, that God had blessed him with to be able to lead the nation of Israel out of, out of Egypt. It was remarkable what he's able to do. One of the most powerful figures in the Old Testament. I think it's kind of interesting. In the New Testament, one of the most powerful figures is the Apostle Paul. When you think about the establishing of the church, and they both had to spend some time in a basket. <laughs> think about that. I don't, you say, what does that mean? I don't know, but it's true. I mean, if you... 
If you look in Acts chapter number 9, Paul's being, after he has to flee Damascus, he's being let down out of the city in a basket. So you have the most powerful figure in the Old Testament and one of the most powerful figures in the New Testament, and both of them had to spend time in a, in a basket. And so it's, it, it is an interesting reminder of what God is willing to, to allow his servants to endure in order to accomplish his purpose. You think about um, Joseph, his journey required a pit. The, the, what led them to where they were at here in Egypt. I mean, Joseph was used to save the world, one of the most powerful figures of that time. When famine would come, he had a plan in place to uh, distribute food to the Egyptians and then to the uh, surrounding areas and God used him in a very mighty way during that furthermore using him to to get his people exactly where he wanted them to be for that sliver and that slice of time but he had to he had to um, survive in a pit for a period of time and then a prison even even after that and uh, we think about Daniel Daniel's journey required a lion's den Daniel's friends uh, we commonly called them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Their journey required a fiery furnace. And here Moses is required a basket. And, you know, the path to, the path to blessing for the, from the Lord or to serving the Lord, that's really how we should look at it. it it's, it's paved at times by spending some time in some places we'd rather not be. Well, if not geographically, I mean, just in a, in a battle, you know, there are things that come our way to refine us and to, and to put us there. And I don't, I don't want to get, uh, you know, too sidetracked, but you think about the life of Joseph, it's interesting, just to give you something to think about, we might, I don't know, maybe some other time we'll talk about this. Every time Joseph changed stations, he had to change coats. Until finally he got to the king's house, he got to where the king was putting the coat on him. You think about that. And so there's, God, there's some things that God does have to take away from us from time to time in order that he can get us to the spot where he can put on us what he desires to put on us. But here's Moses, and he, he, uh, his journey required a basket, of course, as an infant. Uh, the action of Moses' mother here are touching, and they're also full of faith. And again, I don't heard, I've mentioned, we won't, mention it much more, but his, his dad was involved here, but the mom is, is, is where the spotlight, and I think the spotlight rightfully is here. I think that any mother can understand that her burden, no matter how supportive her husband was trying to be or, or was wanting to be, her burden in this situation would have been exceptionally difficult. <laughs> but my how God blesses her. I mean, you think about it, I mean, at just the end of this, he ends, she ends up getting paid by Pharaoh's daughter to take care of her own baby. But then again, there's, there's this other, so she had to put him in a basket, but then think later on, I don't know how old he was, but later on there came to a time where she had to do something that might have even been more scary. She, she had already had to put him in a basket once as a, as, a, as a baby and leave him there on the Nile, but then she had to take him to Pharaoh's house and leave him there. But you know what? Moses turned out okay, didn't he? Why? Because Moses' hand, Moses' life was in the hand of God. And I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm kind of laying it all out in front of us here this evening is in the introduction here. But that's the key. That's, that's the point. When we get to a point where we can't do any more. What do we have to do? We need to put it in the basket. <laughs> we need to put it in the bat. We need to put it in God's hands. We need to put our. This is not. I, I think. I think about this quite frequently when I think about the 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 journey of parenting. But really, there, this isn't a parenting message. But I cannot help but be drawn back to that uh, uh, to that uh, application. Their parents, grandparents are. Whatever stage you might even find, you know, those young ones under your care, there comes a time where you have to put them in the basket and put them in God's hand and let God do what you cannot do. We see here that about this dear lady, we see that she knew what was valuable. 
There's a lot of people that waste a lot of time on things that really don't matter. There's a lot of, lot of things that we can kind of give ourselves to either you know, in worry or in fear, or fr- and they really do not matter. But that wasn't the case here. I always think, you know, I, you know, I have a, you know, I guess everybody does, but you know, I have a way I just kind of look at Scripture and I think of things I certainly don't ever want to be, um, you know, f- be light about it at, at all. But when I read this, either he- here or even the Hebrews 11 uh, kind of summary of it, and it says she saw that he was a proper child in, in Hebrews chapter number 11. Here it says um, in verse number 2, he saw, saw that he was a goodly child. I mean, what if she thought he was ugly? I don't know. What did. There, the, that's not what, I don't think for a moment this is what the Bible was saying. She wasn't measuring. She wasn't looking and, and measuring, is this little person here, really worth it compared to the other little people that are being born, little babies that are being born. That's not what it is. She is expressing the heart of a mother here and what she saw. She understood the value that was in this child. She understood the potential that was in this child. She had no way of knowing what was going to happen in his life as he went forward. She had no way of knowing and think about it as so often is the case and how God works what if God had appeared to her and sent an angel to her before Moses was even born and said, listen, uh, Jochebed, here, here is, here is how, what's going to happen. You're going to have a child and he's going he's gonna to be raised up, become so powerful that he's able to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. She wouldn't have felt like she was up for the task. But she saw the value in Moses. It wasn't about what he might do because that was unknowable by she and her household at the time, but, but she understood how to value the things that God values. We mentioned a moment ago about, about uh, abortion and about the taking of uh, the life of a child. It's, it's reprehensible and not something uh, that we should, we should ever uh, condone, and, 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 and she understood that there was a value in, in that human life because God values human life. And so she, she understood the value of what lay there in front of her. She, she, she was, uh, Pharaoh counted her priority as worth nothing more than the river. I mean, think about, think about the differing ways in which she valued this baby Moses and how Pharaoh valued that baby Moses. Pharaoh said he can be thrown away. Or, or perhaps um, in a slightly more valuable mindset, he might be thinking this can be an offering to the gods. Neither what, neither is acceptable, of course. But what she saw as worth even dying for, Pharaoh said, you know what? It's not even worth, it's, I'll tell you what it's worth. It's worth to be thrown in the river. And what we need to learn is we, we need to learn how to value things the way that God values things. You know, there are certain things that are untouchable. There's a, you think about children. You know, that, that's, there's, that, that's something we need to be extremely jealous over. When it comes to training them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, it is worth the fight. It is worth the risk if there, there was risk involved here. It is worth the risk. It is certainly worth the investment. And trust me, there are plenty out there that are willing to take them and and treat them as nothing more than an offering to the gods, if you will, as worth, worthy of nothing other than the river, if you will, as just something that is a throwaway thing in order to advance an agenda. No, we need to value them the way that God values them. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that are worth our attention, things that are worth the burden. So my first challenge, I guess, to you would be, you know, be careful, the, make sure you guard the burden that you carry around. Some things just aren't even really worth it. You know, it's kind of an interesting thing. I've never been emotionally attached to a squirrel before. 
I just kind of want to see who gets it. I don't know. <laughs> You know, there's this thing where they took this guy's score. You know, it's just, it, you just look it up later. But anyway, it's, uh, <laughs> but, you, you know, something like that creates this, this uh, empathy in, in people. But, but you know, we're, we're not talking about squirrels here. And, you know, of course, I have an opinion about what should, hap- what should not have happened in that situation. But, we, we, you know, we, we, the value is not the same there. <laughs> You see, we need, we need to learn to value things the way that God, that, that will actually relieve a lot of burdens in our life. <laughs> when we learn to see things as important as God sees them as important. <laughs> you know, people are more important than things. His work being accomplished on this earth is, is more important. You know, you could, go, you could go down the list. You could think, and I, and I, I one reason that I was prompted and had this passage on my mind and heart I'm not you know it's obvious what's coming up this week you know there's there are there are important things at stake there so we need to we need to learn to value the things that that God values and so she knew what was valuable but also notice the second thing here as we just we kind of draw some things out here she she did what she could do you notice her faith, which she and her husband are lauded for in Hebrews chapter 11, these people acted on faith according to God's word. They acted on faith. You can put that to rest. They, it was by faith that they, that they did what they did. But her faith, her faith did not provoke her to just kind of throw her hands up in the air and go, well, okay, we'll see what happens. No, she, her faith actually moved her to action. She, she hid Moses for uh, three months. Can you imagine that? You've, you've, uh, your parent or you've been a parent of a, you know, you remember those times of raising a small child. You know how uncomfortable you get in public when they start making noise. <laughs> I remember, I remember, it's funny the things you remember. I remember the first time that my wife and I had, a, our, first, had our first child and the first time we took him out in public. And thinking, is this even allowed? I don't even know if this is, <laughs> if this, this is allowed. I don't know if she wouldn't remember. I, I actually remember, of all the memories to have, I remember this. And thinking, is this, is this even allowed? And, you know, and, and you get, um, you, you know, you hear them make a noise. And, I mean, you, you're, you, you, to you, it sounds like an atomic bomb went off, you know, somewhere. And you're, be quiet. And, I mean, you know, the child's unable to understand even what you're saying and, I mean, you're trying to do everything you can short of smothering them to, to get them to, to be quiet. Now, uh, it, it, of course, if you've been through that, it, it, it gives you great empathy. I've, I've then sat next to parents then in, in public places, and they're going through that same thing with the child. And, and I, with great, I just look down my nose at them like, come on, now I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, one of my great hobbies now, uh, just at the stage of life, you know, we've been, one of my great hobbies now is watching other people parent small children. I just, <laughs> I love it. But, uh, you know, no, I, I, I try to do the opposite. I try to let them know, listen, yeah, I get you. Don't worry about it, you know, because we worry about that. Could you imagine if the, the life or death of your children, plural, maybe, all, maybe the whole household, who, who knows, if the life or death depended on, how quiet you could keep that child from the neighbors and such. I don't know how they went about it in, in their home. I mean, they can be loud. <laughs> and that's what they found out as the child began to, uh, you know, get older, just in that first uh, three months about how those lungs develop. And, but, but she was taking action on her faith that this is something that is worth doing something about. That's how we live productive lives, by the way. We learn to value what God values, and then we commit ourselves to doing things that are worth doing something about. That's kind of the, that's how our time is maximized, right? We determine, all right, what is, what does my faith help me to understand I need to do something about? And, and that's what she was doing. Furthermore, later in the story, she also worked hard to make a vessel that would 
be able to sustain Moses in the water. It says, and when she could, verse 3, could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. I mean, she, she, she had some skill with what she was doing. I mean, I'm pretty sure that right now I couldn't go to the same area of the world, find the materials that she found and, and do it and, and put it together. She did. She knew what she was doing. You can't tell me that that was something that took five minutes. How do, you, how do I know that? She was his mother. <laughs> what she was going to produce was going to be the absolute best thing that she was capable of producing to protect that child when she did what she knew she was going to have to do. You see, and she did that. That's not an absence of faith. That's actually the product of faith. Because she said, this is worth it. Uh, this, this, this matters. This is something that we need to commit our time to and, and to work at. And, and she did that, and, and, and she spent the time there. In Hebrews 11, there again, as I said, they're lauded for their faith. Faith provokes us to find the will of God and obey it. If you look at Hebrews 11, it's filled with people where their faith provoked them to find what was valuable to the Lord, and then to follow through on it. For Abel, he offered the proper sacrifice, the Bible tells us, and it was by faith. Uh, Noah built an ark. You know how he did it? He said, well, he had uh, some know-how, and he had, a, of course, he had all that, but he did it, the Bible says, by faith. By faith, he prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Now, I, again, that's what it takes it's not, going to be, it's not going to be an election that, that really changes it. And, I, and again, I've, if you go back and watch it this morning, I, talked about, I believe firmly that Christians should get out and vote. But we understand that the, the battle is bigger than just an election battle. It's a faith battle. And we need to determine that we're willing to do what faith provokes us to do. Noah built an ark for the uh, saving of his house. Abraham looked for a city um, whose builder and maker is God, the Bible says. How did he do it? He did it by faith. Faith gives substance to that which is not seen. And so she, she, she valued the right thing. She knew how to place the proper value on things, and she did then what she could do. And then the third thing is she put her child in the hand of God. The climax of this story is when Jochebed, I mean, I just, I, let, let's, I, let's read it again in verse 3. We've read the first part a couple, let's read it again together. Read it slowly, just put yourself in her spot for a moment. It says, when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's bank, by the river's brink. Think about what that dear lady had to go through on that day. She had spent time handcrafting that vessel that was going to take care of him. She had done everything that she could do. She had done the best that she could do. She had done what could do no more. And she has this vessel here. She knows its intended destination. My guess is she had already tested it out in, uh, at the river. She had already made the walk. She had already gone through it. She had already put it there. Will it float? Does it stay dry inside? I think this part of the river, there's a very specific uh, location she, by the river's brink. And, and there's, there's certain things you see about it as you go there. That she had no doubt had taken it and placed it. Will it float? Will it stay dry? Is it taking on, is it taking on water? And every time she's doing that, knowing I'm going to have to put my baby in this thing. This was probably the most difficult moment of this woman's life is found there in verse number three, where she takes that baby and puts him in that basket that she has prepared and walks him down to the river's edge and she lays him there in that river's edge and then walks away. And here's what that shows us. That in her mind and in her heart, 
She was not leaving that baby in a basket. She was not leaving that baby in a river. She was leaving that baby in the hand of God. She was putting him completely in God's hand. Why? Because it was worth it. Pharaoh said it's worthy only of the river to be thrown in and, and put to death. But she said no. And she said it's, it's worth fighting for and it's worth preserving. And therefore, when all I can do is this, this is what I'll do. I'll leave him in the hand of God and let God take care of him. And parent, again, this isn't directly specifically to parents this evening, but parents, that is what we must do. We must do everything that we can do. We must pour everything in them that we can, but understand there comes a time where they have to be left in the hand of God. <laughs> left there for him to take care of. Left there for him to do with him as only he can do. She laid him, the Bible says, she laid it in the flags by the river's bank. And on this most difficult day of her life, God is about to perform a miracle that she could not fathom, ex except that, you know, I think she probably had done it before. And do you think maybe she thought, hmm, somebody from Pharaoh's house comes down here regularly, and she's a lady, she understands, maybe God can do something in her heart. And that's what he does. This is a picture of commending something or someone to the Lord. Paul did this with the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter number 20. In verse 32, the Bible says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God. He was, he was not going to be there with them any longer. He had helped establish the church and churches there in Asia Minor, and, and he had been a part of that. He's, he's meeting with them what would be one last time, and he says, I commend you to God. And to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. He put them, these were, these were pastors of churches that were there in that area. And he, they, they couldn't have been around very long. They had to be fairly newly uh, you know, established. It just wasn't that much time, but Paul had poured his life in them. And he came to a point and he said, all right, you're in God's, you're in God's hands now. What we must do as believers is to learn how to take the things that are truly valuable and instead of them being a burden and a trouble for us, put them in the hands of God and let him do the work that needs to be done. He spent time in her house, three months. For three months, that place was a place of peace and safety until it got to the point where she couldn't hide him any longer and so what did she have to do that then that house it was no longer a place of peace and safety it was a place of stress and difficulty every time he made a noise it would be a concern did the neighbors hear that that's louder than it normally has been the neighbors are going to find out you know and somebody might somebody might report us and all you know is that is that something that we're gonna that that we can deal with or talk and, and what was a place of Peace and tranquility now has become a place of stress. And when it got to that point, what did you have to do? Leave it in God's hands. Amen. And friend, you might, there might be something that you're carrying with you. I know, I know for a lot of folks that, you know, with election week, you know, there's some valuable things that people care about. <laughs> Wonderful things that God has worked in. They wonder, is this going to be able to last any longer? There comes a point, you just got to put it in God's hands. <laughs> You've got to lay it in the river, put it in the basket, lay it in the river, but really what you're doing is you're leaving it in God's hands. Amen. There comes that point where there's that one that you're burdened about that is wayward, that's walked away from the Lord, and you don't know what to do, and you've, 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 you're praying, you're doing everything that you can do, but you've got to just put them in God's hands, just leave them in the river. Just put them in God's hands and let God, let God do the work that he can do. You know, when you do that, miraculous things take place. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of things where God wants to break us down from what we think we're doing so that he can show us what he is capable of doing. 
She couldn't walk up to Pharaoh's house and go, hey, will you take this baby? But God could get him there. Furthermore, God used the most tumultuous of times in order to accomplish one of his grandest tasks that has ever been accomplished here on this earth, which was getting the nation of Israel out of the land of Egypt in the promised land. It's momentous in the scale of human history, in the scope of Bible prophecy, it's momentous. And he used the tumultuous times here that they were living in in order to make that happen. When we put something in, when we put things in God's hands, suddenly we give him an opportunity to work and we can stand back as it were and see him work the miracle. And of course he did. Jochebed's faith here is an example to us all. There are many things that we value. We have a responsibility to do our part, to plan, to prepare, to be wise, to all of those, to speak, whatever. We have a responsibility, but ultimately, we must be willing to put those things in God's hands and trust him. I think the most direct application I keep coming back is parents and children. Have you put them in God's hand? You say, how, how do you? I remember, I remember being younger and having hearing my dad speak and preach and other preachers like him say, I don't know how in the world, you know, my you know, my kids are gonna raise their kids. Now that's that's a great thanks, you know. Now that I think back, well, how encouraging, but <laughs> but the answer is simple. We just have to put them in God's hands. <laughs> I wish, I wish the world were different, right? I wish all sorts of things were different. I wish we could change a lot of things. But, you know, we, we can do only what we can do. And then when we come to the end of ourselves, all that's left is we've got to put them in God's hands and let him do the work. What, what do you need? What do you need to put in the basket tonight? Is, it, is there anything valuable? Enough? Maybe there's something that you're, wor you're, you're, you're worried about. It's not even worth it. Just, just throw it away. But there's, if there's something of value... Put it in the basket, lay it in the river, leave it in God's hand, and let him do the work that he can do. Lord, thank you for this day, and thank you for uh, how you give us these great stories of faith in the Bible that help us along our journey. Lord, what an amazing unsung hero of the faith here what these parents did in the life of Moses. Lord, we sang as a hymn even, I surrender all. And uh, Lord, that's often an invitation song, but really it's what we need to do is to surrender all. Not We think of that often as just an act of our will or surrendering rebellion and, and, and submitting to you, but really there's many things that we need to just stop worrying about, stop fretting about. We need to place it in your hand and let you do the work that only you can do. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand if you will. We'll sing a verse of us, an invitation and you respond to the Lord as he has worked in your heart this evening.
Father, again, thank you for allowing us to come together again. I pray that you would be with us now throughout the week, give folks safety on the road, help us to, to honor you and, our, and during our business throughout the week. And uh, Lord, we thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. It's good to see you this evening. Brother McKeever is going to lead us in our course. Appreciate him pulling Brother Double Duty while Brother Matt was out of, out of town. And uh, appreciate his hard work, but he's going to lead us in our course, and then you're dismissed. Make me a blessing.